Welcome to the Gals Guide to the Galaxy podcast, where a group of gals gather for you one cool thing around our topic of the month. Is it ancient history? Is it breaking news? Is it safe for work? Well, that's up to each gal. All we know is that... Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Welcome back. This is Eden, and it's Black History Month at Gal's Guide. I'm joined by Bonnie, Kim, and Rebecca uh, talking about our one cool thing. So we've already talked about uh, the coolness that is Carol Walker and the awesomeness that is Nina Simone. So let's have a get-to-know-you question before I launch into my one cool thing. So here's your question, ladies. If you could meet... Any person of American history, who would it be? Oh, man. Anybody? Anybody. Oh, gosh. Well, if we're doing uh, Black History Month, I think it would be really cool to hear Sojourner Truth talk. Because she did not... History rewrites her as having, like, a southern accent. She was born and she was a slave in the north and raised by, like, a Dutch family. So she's got like a Dutch accent. So I would really love to hear her um, anti-woman speech in her own voice. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. Kim? Kim. Oh, man. I have a really hard time deciding, but I think, um, God, it could be anybody, really. (laughs) It could be a woman. It could be a man. Like, just any, like prominent strong person from history that really made a difference that got people to listen to them um like we were talking about harriet tubman during the break we were talking about malcolm x and you know martin luther king jr and like just a bunch of different people but i think i would ask them all the same question and the question i'd ask is how did you stay strong like during the times Mm. when everyone is against you Because I think we all kind of go through that struggle. Like, we want to make a difference, but it's so hard, you know? But, like, if they heard it from the, you know, the mouth of the person who we idolize, I think it would really help even motivate people even more to be their best. And, um, of course, I would want to know about their life and all that stuff. (laughs) But I think that would be, like, my, my end question. Like, how did you stay strong? Or maybe my opening question, you know? But um, just how did you get through those low times to make it so that you and the haters and all that stuff? Because that's something I think I would struggle with, like, a lot. So I guess I switched the question a little bit. (laughs) That would be my one question I would ask anybody, really. Um, So I apologize. No, that's that's valid. That works for me. Miss Rebecca? So I'm, uh, it's hard because I'm, I want to. Choose, so I'm going to do two. Or maybe I'll do three. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like narrow it down. So I think, so like maybe my number one person, I liked the, uh, even before we started recording, mentioned Nikola Tesla. So that's, that's not necessarily my one, but I, I just like that as an idea. Um, I, I know it's going to sound corny, but like Abraham Lincoln, because I want to know, was he really, like, did he really want to free slaves or not? Because I know that becomes like a big controversy especially among certain people who argue why we had civil war. So that'd be one question. I'd, uh, one of the questions I want to ask, of course, I want to ask a million questions. Plus he was also a lawyer. Plus he was also, everybody knows who he is. Um, but then more recent, um, I think it, it'd be kind of maybe a tie between Josephine Baker. Who I've seen a one woman show about her. So I kind of feel like, it. not that I've actually talked to that actress after, but she just did such a, amazing job that I felt like I was getting to know her because she went through like her whole life story, but also incorporated um, a lot of her songs. And then another one that I've recently been seeing and mentioning, who's not a woman, but because we're gals guy and I guess we try to do women, but um, would be Bayard Rustin. I think a lot of people just don't know who he is. And he, what, you know, he worked very closely with Martin Luther King. He was very involved in the civil rights movement. He lived until the eighties. But because he was um, gay, people just don't give him the same credit. Or at least that's kind of one of the theories anyway, why he doesn't get as much credit as maybe he should. So he's just somebody that I think is really interesting. And if nothing else, hopefully anyone listening to this will want to get to know more about him. But I um, yeah, I like the idea of like, how did you stay strong? How did you, 
you know, how did you manage to balance like having a personal life and also being an activist? And, and what did that, um, you know, and do you think like, and I guess if, I, if somehow I could meet him today, like, you know, 30 plus years after his death, like, do you, what do you think still needs to be done um, that maybe you started that you think needs to still continue? That's a good one. Okay. So, um, my person would be James Baldwin. Um, I find him incredibly fascinating. Um, he, uh, I, I think of James Baldwin as an American philosopher of a contemporary time. Um, he was doing his thing kind of in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, he uh, was incredibly uh, learned. He was incredibly um, philosophical. Um, he was really a man ahead of his time. Of course, I can say that about a lot of the people we've oh, been yeah. talking about. <laughs> They've kind of all been ahead of their time, but in a lot of ways, they really weren't ahead of their time. They were right in the time they needed to be, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't be where we are today if it hadn't been for them being part of their time, even though they were kind of ahead of their time. Um, but James Baldwin is kind of the epitome of everything um, – that is genius uh, about America and mm -hmm. and its history. You know, he uh, he his eloquence was just amazing. Absolutely. And if you haven't seen "I Am Your Negro," which is the documentary about him, uh, you ought to because that's uh, also amazing. So he, I know that was kind of a one cool thing, <laughs> but my actual one cool thing uh, is a man who's very close to my heart. He was my great grandfather. His name was Willis Richardson. And very few people know who he is. Um, everybody knows who Lorraine Hansberry is, though. Lorraine Hansberry, the playwright who wrote uh, A Raisin in the Sun, mm -hmm. is considered the benchmark of um, contemporary um, playwriting of the black American experience. Uh, obviously it's about a family going through their thing. Um, Lorraine Hansberry grew up, um, with a lot of movers and shakers, uh, coming in and out of her household and in and out of her life based on who her parents were. And one of those, uh, individuals was W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the co-founders of the NAACP. Well, he was a big uh, champion um, of uh, black people and black history and black movers and shakers. And he was around during the time of the Harlem Renaissance. And even though my great grandfather did not live in Harlem, in fact, he didn't live in New York, he was born in Wilmington, North Carolina. And when he was a child, his family moved to Washington, D.C. So he really grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, he worked for the Department of Engraving, Printing and Engraving, so he literally made money. <laughs> 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 but his side hustle, if you will, was being a playwright. He is, uh, if anybody knows him at all, it's because he was the first black playwright to write a contemporary drama, which was about a, a black American family, uh, and have that uh, production go to Broadway. Oh, wow. And um, so basically there wouldn't have been a, a Lorraine Hansberry if there hadn't been a Willis Richardson. Mm -hmm. And the connection is W.E.B. Du Bois. He was a big fan of my great grandfather and his writings. Um, he was very prolific uh, in the 20s, which was the time of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, I think it was 1924 when his play, The Chip Woman's Fortune, hit Broadway. Um, he wrote mostly one-act plays. He wrote a few three-act plays. Um, 
and he wrote a series of children's plays. Mm -hmm. So he wrote a lot about um, events in black history, in American history. So in black history in Africa, black history in America, um, contemporary kind of family situations. Uh, they were all dramas um, and they were all made so that people would learn something, either something about history or something about the human condition, something along the lines that black people are people too, you know, during a time when a lot of pe black, a lot of people didn't believe that black people were really people mm -hmm. I mean you know this is the early part of the 20th century when you still had a lot of holdover you know you still had Jim Crow and you still had all kinds of craziness um he really didn't uh reach uh fame as we think of fame um he died um it was right around his birthday, actually, in November of 1977. And he was awarded, he was given a Viv Award, also known as an Adelco, which is short for Audience Development Committee Award. Um, it was established in 1973 by a woman named Vivian Robinson, which is why they're also called the Viv, Viv Awards. Mm -hmm. But they honor excellence in African-American theater in the New York City area. And oh. obviously Broadway is yeah. in New York City, so there you go. Nice. Um, he was given this posthumously because he had already passed away. Um, and I vaguely remember being a kid and knowing that um, like my dad, my grandmother, uh, they were gonna go to Washington DC because he was getting this award. And I didn't understand how you could give somebody a war, an award if they're not there to receive it because right. they're dead. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's that. Mm -hmm. But um, Willis Richardson is uh, very much still remembered in his hometown, in his birthplace of Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, there is a group that calls themselves the Willis Richardson Players, mm -hmm. and they named themselves after him. They are a theater group, an African-American theater group. Um, I think there are members of the theater group that are not necessarily black, but um, and they don't have a set location, but they are a theater group, and they do a couple of productions throughout the year. And they also have... Um, uh, they have events where young people, uh, high schoolers, go through a program, kind of like uh, we in Indianapolis have the Asante Children's Theater. They have like a version of that there. And so a lot of their quote unquote graduates of their youth group um, go on to become adults in the Willis Richardson Players. Oh, that's mm -hmm. neat. So yeah, my uh, my grandmother was the middle of his three daughters. He only had daughters. <laughs> <laughs> she was his middle daughter. Uh, the youngest one died very young. Um, well, she had two children, but she was a young adult. Mm, okay. And um, the oldest one, believe it or not, is the one that lived the longest. <laughs> Really? Oh. <laughs> yes, I actually got to see her a few years before she passed away. Um, and it was so amazing because she opened the door and she looked just like her sister, my grandmother. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, and my grandmother died when I was a teenager. So it was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it would have been. <laughs> that was amazing. But um, I, apparently I don't get to Washington, Washington D.C. often enough. <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, so, yes, my grandmother was very proud of her father, um, as was my dad, being very proud of his grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, in a previous uh, podcast episode, we were talking about places we would like to visit. Mm -hmm. And um, Bonnie mentioned the, um, the museum, mm -hmm. the African-American History Museum mm -hmm. that they recently opened. Uh, one of my cousins... Um, technically one of my dad's cousins. Um, she's actually the daughter of the younger sister who died as a young adult. Mm -hmm. Her name is Joyce. Joyce went to the museum and saw one of the um, anthologies of plays that my great grandfather was an editor for the book. Um, it included his, some of his plays as well as other African-American 
playwrights plays and it's on display oh my god there oh, a, awesome. a copy of it now and, and so she took a picture of it and she mm. <laughs> sent it around to everybody and we were like, like Yay! Look where I am. Yeah. um but i grew up in a family that we all knew who he was and what he did um Nobody I knew knew who he was or what he did Mm -hmm. outside of our family until I got to IU and I had a class with Winona Fletcher, who was an African-American woman who taught um, courses in African-American dramatic literature. Mm -hmm. And so she straddled both the theater department and the African-American studies department. And um, I did take two of her classes through the department of theater, but She's when she found out that I was coming, she wrote me and said, you have to come visit me. I have class on this day at this time. Come. Well, (laughs) I'm like, okay, you know, all right. So I go, but she's in the middle of class and I didn't want to interrupt. And here I am a freshman. So I just waited until class was over. And then she's like, why didn't you come in? I'm like, well, I didn't want to interrupt you. You're like, you know, the teacher and stuff. And she's like, no, I wanted to like show you off. Apparently this woman would go around giving lectures on my great grandfather Oh my goodness, that's And wonderful. she was the first person outside of the family that I knew that knew who he was. Oh and here she's giving lectures. So we became very good friends. I took as many classes of hers as I possibly could. Um, and I got to do my own little presentations on mm-hmm. him in her classes. So um, that was really, that was really special. Um, I'm sure she's probably up there in heaven talking his ear off. Right? <laughs> You know, because she was an elderly woman when I knew her back in the early 90s. But um, but anyway, so that's my uh, my one cool thing. That's so cool. (laughs) (laughs) And that follows along with your genealogy, like love. too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. My um, my grandmother made sure that she owned every one of his books. Um, He wrote plays that he never published. And so uh, I think some of those manuscripts are at Howard University, um, which where is where he attended. Um, I think he attended, but I know that's where my grandmother Mm -hmm. attended was Howard University. And then I think um, I think Columbia University or one of the universities in New York City also has some of his manuscripts. Neat. But yeah. Did you like gather all the copies you can and like have a... (gasps) Yes. Big library. Just like <laughs> this works. Yes. And I, the funny thing is, I remember I, you know, when I was a kid, I had a copy of the set of children's plays mm-hmm. that he wrote. And I remember, you know, using this really old book, you know, and mm. I would like act out some of his plays and stuff. So when I went to graduate school, um, that was one of my kind of dreams was to be able to one day do one of his plays. Oh, absolutely. You know, I thought that would be like really cool. So have you seen one of his plays performed anywhere? No, I have not. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most of the people that do his plays are either the Will, the Willis Richardson players in North Carolina or they're in the DC area. Um, I think sometimes uh, Howard university might do, you know, a round of his plays, Mm -hmm. um, like, like they, I think they have like a plays of African history or plays Mm -hmm. of African American history or something like that. And I think they do them, but that's a long way away from Indiana. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like I, said, I wonder if one have of them would like, like a video of any of them, like on that's what like, I was going to record or post or something. No, um, oh. I have I've combed their web page <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> for all yeah. kinds of stuff, and they've got pictures, yeah, from productions, but they don't actually have um video. Maybe for copyright um, reasons or something uh, maybe, like that. yeah. Um, but uh. You know, I that that's definitely in addition to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one of my things mm-hmm. that I would like to do in life is is go to Wilmington and um, you know, and and check out the William the the Willis Richardson players. Absolutely. I also recently discovered that the very first home he and my great grandmother lived in 
is on the um, African American cultural trail of Washington oh. D.C. Hmm. So, and that's got a picture, and it's got the like the plaque thing right outside. And I was like, oh my god, that's cool! It's not oh, the house yeah. I remember, yeah. Mm. You know, um, mm. and it's not the house my dad remembered. <laughs> so it was the house that they lived in, I think, when they had um, their first child, and mm. then they moved to the house to the brownstone that we all um knew okay i was really young but i do remember meeting him and visiting a couple times and so it's nice to have those memories absolutely (laughs) absolutely oh how cool i don't know i that was impressive (laughs) i'm just still processing i think (laughs) Well, and, he has, and it's nice to know he has a legacy, right? That there's still people that do, per, even if you have an extra right. able to yeah. find it, it's knowing that there's a, right. an appreciation beyond just your family, even if it's not exactly. something mm-hmm. that you knew about until more exactly. recently. Right. Right. So, and I've, I've written them, um, I don't know how often, since they don't have their own space, mm-hmm. you know, it, I, you know, I'm not sure how often they you know, do their thing. Um, they tend to rent a, the same space each time. So they clearly have a partnership somewhere. Right. Um, but. Uh, yeah, like their website looks like they haven't updated since 2015. Right. So maybe they're. Right. Maybe they have like social media. Yeah, but maybe they're just not super active. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because, yeah, when you don't have your own facility, you don't really yeah. have like a a solid presence you know then you're just a group of people that get together and i and i really don't think they have that many productions i think they may only have like two or three a year mm. you have to get on them say hey you need to i think i'm gonna have to, <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to. <laughs> y'all I mean, need to step it up right? or see that's like another call you can make to brian fonseca right be like hey exactly if you've got some openings exactly. here's like a lo- like here's somebody that is someone you probably haven't already done even though it's older but it might be worthwhile to try to get the exactly. rights to it now that he has this especially now that he has his own um, exactly his own theater company might be something he'd be interested in. or even, right again just a reading or just something to mm-hmm. make it exactly raise that so awareness. um absolutely um, one more thing, um, like I said, he was born in Wilmington, but he moved to uh, Washington, D.C. Um, on November 10th, um, 1898, there was a race, a race riot mm. in Wilmington. And um, it lasted actually a couple of days, um, but... Uh, he was, you know, nine, ten ish, somewhere in there. And uh, what happened was everybody voted because it was right after vote election day. And a lot of the African Americans managed to vote in um, elected officials who were also African American. Mm-hmm. And the white people weren't real happy about that. Mm-hmm. So um, they actually staged a pogrom. I don't know if you know what that is, but a pogrom, uh, most of the time you hear that word, it's in the context of uh, the days of the Holocaust, Mm -hmm. where um, you had a state-sponsored massacre. Yeah, Mm -hmm. the state would sponsor, would say, hey, go in there and just wipe everybody out. We don't like to think of that happening here in America, but it Mm -hmm. totally did. And so the white people of Wilmington essentially went into the black communities of Wilmington and, um, and just started destroying property and burning down homes. People um, ran, I guess there's like some swamp land. um, And so they ran out into the swamp area to try to get away. The problem was you had all the bugs and you had the malaria and you've got, you know, so a lot of people, died where they tried to escape to um and so um my great my great grandfather's dad moved them all to washington dc and then went back to wilmington to try to like get the rest of their stuff 
you know, and basically he was never seen nor heard from again. Mm -hmm. So the idea is he was one of the um, people who were killed uh, because this kind of massacre riot thing went on for like two or three days. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, he never returned. So here you have, you know, a young man and an older teenage girl and the mom, <laughs> you know, now they're in a new location where they're not from. And, you know, it's not like you had welfare and she really couldn't like just get a job kind of thing. Um, so that was, you know, that was very tragic. So, but there are, there are some questions about my great grandfather's, um, childhood and history that nobody ever really knew mm -hmm. because anytime somebody would ask they he would give a different answer mm, really <laughs> but through my um there was a woman who wrote a book about him um christine gray she's since passed away but she was a um an english professor for a community college in maryland and she wrote a book called willis richardson forgotten pioneer of African-American theater, something along those lines. Okay. And um, she discovered evidence that actually his much older sister, who was like 18 when he was born, might have, or 17, somewhere in there, she was late, up, upper teens, may have actually been his mother and not his sister. Mm. And that her parents raised him as though he were theirs because mm -hmm. of all the stigma and mm -hmm. all that. And the theory goes that she worked in um, a furniture store that was owned by a white man, and they may have had a relationship that resulted in my great-grandfather. Huh. And, um, of course, that was illegal. Yeah. <laughs> the relationship was illegal, and his existence was illegal. Mm -hmm. So uh, that may have been why they kind of fudged who actually had the baby kind of thing. Yeah. But there is an insurance policy that was taken out in my great-grandfather's name, but with this other last name. And there were letters written after they moved to Washington, D.C., in which this man said, you know, he won't want for anything. I'll make sure he's got books and I'll make sure he's got everything he needs for his education and all that. And my great grandfather loved to read. So something he clearly passed on to right. me because <laughs> I love to read. In the family. Yeah. Oh, wow. Very cool. And don't forget to check out Eden. She's actually going to be our guest speaker and amazing knowledge master of genealogy for next week and also Black History Month. So she kind of intertwines it. And she, we actually, she did it last year and it was so fascinating and not enough time that we are asking her to do the exact same thing with whatever twist she wants to be. And that's next Thursday night at um, Barley. Uh, island in Noblesville um, from seven to nine. So don't forget to be there. Everyone's welcome. February the 29th or the 28th. Sorry. So it's, oh, it's the, at the end the, of the month. I'm sorry. The exact last day of February then. Okay. Very good. So don't forget to check that out and join us um, at Barley Island on the 28th, seven to 9 PM. For show notes, links, and images from this week's show, visit galsguide.org. Want exclusive stuff like deleted bits and major bloopers? Become a Gals Guide patron today. Thanks for listening. <laughs>